Hi, my name is Ricardo Sosa, and this is a talk for the first International Symposium on Intelligent Design at JAIST in Japan. Thank you for inviting me. The title of my talk is Artificial Creativity, Technical and Ethical Challenges for the Future of Design Creativity and AI. Because I'm going to be talking about creativity, I want to just start with this image, which is an inspiration to me. This, this is a piece of art coming from Ecuador, uh, Cuenca in the south of Ecuador. Um, and, and, and I bring it here because I want to acknowledge the different original cultures around the world and the very different worldviews or ontologies that they have. So I want to start with a personal story here. Um, this is a story back from 1991. A professor of ours asked us to do a design assignment and he was very explicit about us not using computers for this assignment. You have to remember two things. The first one is that at the time, design schools didn't really teach computer, computational topics. And of course, the, the, the use of computers for design tasks um, to begin with was in its infancy. So I still think of that design professor 30 years ago um, being quite explicit about the need to learn, the need for us to learn design um, by hand, not using computers. It's an anecdote that I think captures a lot of the thinking back then at that time about what computers could and, and couldn't do. And of course, conversely, what humans could and couldn't do. Today, the anecdote sounds perhaps dated or perhaps ridiculous, but I think that the way design creativity and computers are understood today, 30 years later, hasn't really changed that much. Of course, for that assignment, I broke the rule and I did use computers. But I didn't use a computer in the way that our professor had feared. I didn't use CAD. Um, I, instead, I did all the drawings by hand. What I did do is I wrote some code using HyperCard at the time to select at random three words from a dictionary and flash them on the screen for a few seconds. Um, with my team, we use this program during our brainstorming sessions to help us come up with new design concepts. It was a very simple tool but it helped us look for unexpected associations and deal with conceptual block. So we ended up crediting the software for helping us in the ideation process. And I think the professor in a reluctant, reluctantly um, gave us an A for the, for the assignment. So that story was from 30 years ago, the 1990s. Let's try and imagine what will happen 30 years from now in the 2050s. How will computers shape design creativity then? I might not be around, so it's relatively easy for me to speculate. Futurists have the advantage, the advantage of not being alive to be accountable for their predictions. But in all seriousness, in this talk, I will try to address some ideas that might help you inform your research or your practice in anticipation of what the future might bring. So here I define um, some basic terms for clarity. By design creativity, I mean the novelty-oriented activity that designers carry out when responding to wicked problems. And note that, note that I'm not using the, the term creativity in an artistic sense. By artificial intelligence, I mean the colloquial term that refers to computational approaches such as machine learning and evolutionary systems. I therefore use the, the term artificial creativity to broadly refer to the intersection between advanced digital approaches to generate, simulate, uh, or support creativity. Of course, a substantial amount of thinking and experimenting with computers took place in the second half of the 20th century. And by the final decade in the 1990s, we see a, a consolidation of many research programs specifically addressing creativity and computers. I don't have the time here for a historical overview, so I will only say that while these efforts show high ingenuity and technical prowess, they mostly help to realize how complex it is to define and study design creativity and how difficult it would turn out to be um, to model creativity using computers. Some of the most substantial understandings of that work is that we were um, that if we were to represent creativity using fitness landscapes, then creativity takes place in rugged rather than smooth landscapes. And the fitness landscape itself is dynamic rather than static, with those changes occurring both due to the search process itself as well as externalities. So I think by now we understand that artificial creativity is 
is going to be really hard. In those early decades, contributions came from multiple disciplines, even from art and science. Yet behind this apparent diversity, a very specific demographic was engaged in that early research. You can tell by looking at the names of the authors at that time. That demographic is still dominant today, mostly white, mostly men, with only a few exceptions. I suggest that the stagnation of artificial creativity these days, despite the substantial increase in computational power in the last five decades, has more to do with the specific ontological nature of, of the research questions that are dominating in this area. This ontological homogeneity has caused research in artificial creativity to be constrained to a very narrow understanding of what creativity is and how to use computers to generate, stimulate or support creativity. To some extent, artificial creativity is stuck in time with some notable mentions, but largely tackling toy problems that fail to convince most people and worse, fail to inform or address creativity. Ontologies are ways of seeing the world around us, so naturally they are very hard to characterize. How do you ask a fish what water is? But for our purposes, this caricature here on the screen helps us understand the last five decades of artificial creativity. The idea you see that human creativity takes place inside a head and out comes a creative idea. And therefore, artificial creativity is to be synthesized by a program and out comes a creative idea. But think of these questions. Um, if, we, if we reformulate the question, um, the typical question in, in artificial creativity, can computers be creative? Let's try and reach uh, and change them and reframe them. Can computers be persuasive? Can computers be charismatic? Can computers be funny? Well, all of these are situational, social, relational characteristics. These are things that are defined in social evaluation, in context. Within this ontology, the way to identify creative ideas is that an, of, an effect is first observed and then retrospectively we look into the past looking for the one origin or cause of this effect, the creative idea that created the change. The underlying assumption here is that there must be a creative idea created by an individual, and again, is usually male, usually white. A different way of seeing creativity is to think that artifacts and ideas that have a major effect are actually assembled over time by many actors. So less of a light bulb turning on inside the head of a, of, a, of a gifted or a talented individual and more as a network effect, something that happens that accumulates and aggregates over time and by different people. This renders as a futile quest the need to locate the individual creator to explain an observed impact, um, which is a signature of the dominant ontology in artificial creativity. So we see here we, we have Margaret Bowden um, and we see in this ontology um, how the research questions for artificial creativity are framed. Modeling to understand, to simulate, to evaluate or to generate creativity. You see, these type of research questions show a, a way of thinking about the object of study, in this case creativity, as something that a person does alone. Creativity as something that takes place inside the head of individuals, whether they are gifted or everyday um, individuals. Creativity is still portrayed in this ontology as an individual capacity. Um, this individualism, of course, is inherited from a very peculiar view of intelligence um, in the fields of psychology and, of course, in artificial intelligence. Something that can be measured in individuals. Personally, this way of approaching artificial creativity seemed rather narrow to me all the way back when I started working in this area around the year 2000, 2001. Even back then, I thought, what if we reframe creativity as a systems property? What if individuals who are recognized for producing creative ideas, you know, in every book on artificial creativity, there is going to be a mention of Einstein 
and Mozart and Picasso. Um, what if they, um, if they were recognized because of social conditions, such as gender, um, ethnic, or class privilege? Um, questions turn into whether the, the questions turn into whether and how computers amplify support and train creativity at the population level, not at the individual level necessarily. So Bowden um, makes a binary distinction between P and H creativity, personal and historical creativity, showing the limits um, the, of the individualistic ontological view. The PH distinction indicates that social evaluation is a constant constituent process of creativity. You see in the in the definitions um, she does refer to other people and this is essential to define both P and H creativity. This, may, this makes it quite clear that creativity is not possible with individual synthesis alone. Instead, creativity is a phenomenon whose definition is based on both synthesis and evaluation. So consider um, something that I'm calling here C creativity in addition to P or H creativity, C creativity. And this is um, an idea that could not have been imagined by any single person alone, but it's only possible through augmentation of individual reasoning. Now C can stand for collaborative creativity when this is done in teams, especially highly diverse teams, um, or it can stand for computational uh, creativity when it's done in teams between um, formed by human and by by humans and by computers. So since creativity has this constituent social dimension, evaluation, it follows that asking whether a computer can be creative is unproductive and misleading. Artificial creativity would need to be embedded in a social context rather than trying to emulate a brain in a jar. I attended the first computational creativity workshop in 2003 in Acapulco, Mexico. Nearly 20 years later, this community, which is now constituted in the, in the Association for Computational Creativity and holding annual international conferences, scoffs at mere generation. But the ontology is untouched, it remains untouched. When evaluation is considered, it continues to be at the individual level with things such as intentionality and so on. The field continues to build systems under the ontological view that creation and evaluation take place inside the individual. Most in the field still fail to appreciate the paradox that what these systems produce is then evaluated um, socially by humans. Some of, us, some of us have been studying this for nearly two decades, but only a few people have paid attention. We've been working with models where social evaluation is part of the system and, and when there is, there is no creativity without social evaluation. So moving forward, artificial creativity, research questions are going to need some serious rethinking at the ontological level. How does a fundamentally social artificial creativity looks like? We don't know yet, but here I put forward a vantage point for a glimpse of what is possible in the future. Through computational social simulations, we have tackled creativity at what we call the meso level in the last 15 years. The interactions between micro or individual levels and macro or social processes. This has been, of course, building on the ideas um, that have remained ma marginalized in mainstream creativity, such as those by Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi and Robert Weisberg to, and Lian Gabora, to mention a few. These artificial creativity models um, that we've been building de-emphasize individuals as causal origins of creativity and emphasize situational creativity at the meso level. Some of the things that we have studied in principle, not that we are replicating existing uh, or trying to model existing systems, but we're studying them in principle, include things like the power of minorities as change agents, the role of strong and weak ties in creativity, how hierarchies affect the uptake of new ideas, the strategic role of timing in minorities being able to influence majority groups, the creation of novelty by recombination of established ideas between groups, the diminishing returns of group size in organizational creativity, and more recently, the fallacy behind a, a priori categorization such as the little c and the big c creativity. 
In these studies, we use simulation as an aid to theorize about creativity. But now let me change gears. I'm going to move now into a more speculative area for the future of artificial creativity. And I want to talk about a system that is keeping us busy in our research group these days. This is the use of GP3 as a language-based aid for human computer creativity. The way we arrived here is um, we were running, a, um, conducting a different study where we were interviewing 10 uh, professional designers with a lot of experience in their field. And we gave them a brief um, uh, with some information and we were recording, we recorded the first five to seven minutes of the designers tackling, um, addressing the brief, responding to the brief. And after we did that project, we had the coding, we have um, the, the, the we, we were addressing the research questions of that study, which are different, are not relevant here. But then we got access to GP3 um, and uh, through OpenAI. Uh, this is a generative pre-trained transformer three. And what we did is we, we used as inputs the beginning of the answers of these professional designers. And we let the system, we use the system in what they call idea generation mode uh, with a limited response, response length of 128 characters and a temperature of 0.7. Um, so with some randomness, but not too much. And we were interested to see what GP3 would produce in terms of new ideas, building on what the designers, the 10 designers uh, initially uh, framed in the first few words of their response. And what we saw was a combination of disappointing and um, very exciting uh, um, results. Um, so here, what you can see on the, on the, on the screen, um, you don't need to read all of it, but you can see on the left-hand side is what designer M said. So this is one, one particular case. And in this particular case, a designer, their first reaction to the brief is to come up with a top-down map of the neighborhood where the person lives in, in the brief. And then, and, and the person says, and then just like show by this wall and then people can color in or like make art for their friends and the units they live in. Sort of personalize them and then people could. And that's where we interrupted what the designer said. And then we get um, on the right-hand side, highlighted in yellow, what GP3 said. So we have four of, of many other um, responses. Um, we see in the first one how GP3 um, suggests that a website is built, um, such as a Facebook page for the community. Then on the second one, we have, um, perhaps because of the word art, um, the GP3 suggesting the use of music, writing on the ground or paint a mural, or start using music. And then the, the system gives a style, and then it says perhaps people could create a playlist of music, and then maybe people in the area could listen to those songs. So this is this is this is these are interesting ideas. These are ideas that you know having a, a soundtrack of the of the neighborhood that can be collaboratively created. Um, and then the the GP3 mentions um, GP3 mentions a game, so goes in, in that direction of gamification as a way of of addressing this um, problem in the in the brief that had to do with social isolation in a neighborhood. And then on the on the third response, they talked about um, creating kind of like virtual um, versions of the neighborhood. And and then, of course, the um, the final parts of, of, of those um, indicate a lot of noise and uh, much less interesting um, responses. But what, what we were excited to see here are two things. These are the type of ideas that are not um, on, unlike what you get in the brainstorming sessions. So we're seeing here, evidently, GP3 doesn't understand what, what, um, what it's giving. But that doesn't matter when you're talking about ideation that much. Because for ideation, you don't um, you, remember that in ideation, you suspend judgment of ideas. So kind of like having this um, input from a system, can we see a lot of potential there. We're seeing a lot of potential there and we're designing right now some studies to, to, to look at this more formally. 
Um, this, this gives us some glimpse of the possibilities using GP3, systems like GP3. The potential could be here for artificial creativity to help designers reframe the brief, reframe, reframe the problem, uh, recombine ideas, extend, find alternatives, such as the Facebook page or the uh, soundtrack or the virtual um, version of the neighborhood and so on. Um, but of course, these are not going to be produced by the, the expectation here under this ontology that I'm talking about is not that we expect the system to design the solution for us. Um, this has to be still in a synergistic coupling with the humans who are actually the interface to the, to the world, to the real problem. So I was interested to see if other people are using uh, GP3 in this sense. And fair enough, there is this um, YouTuber with a lot of followers, Tom Scott. And he shows in a recent video, he shows an example of using GP3 to, to generate new ideas for videos, for the videos that he creates. And he reports similarly several, several dumb ideas, which are, by the way, as I said before, the staple of ideation and what he calls one in 1,000 interesting ideas. So a creative system will then um, necessarily be open, embedded in a social and um, material uh, reality inhabited by humans. But that's not the main conclusion here. The key point that I want to make with this example is um, to ask ourselves, then what? Can human-machine creativity be significantly different from human creativity? This to me is a, is a much more interesting um, prospect for the next few years. It's not about um, us creating computers that are creative and figuring out what computational creativity can be different from human creativity. I think what is much more interesting is whether human-machine creativity or co-creativity with computers can be significantly different from human creativity. How can we use artificial creativity to generate variants, to support ideation and reframing, to inform prototyping, to ask interesting questions, or to train people um, on ideation skills? There is a lot that artificial creativity can do without understanding. What C creativity means for artificial creativity is a move away from questions that are not so useful such as can computers be creative and into more powerful questions around how computers can augment the creativity and the innovability of systems. So here we have the well-known um, uh, futures cone. So on the, on the left-hand side is a present and then uh, it opens to the right-hand side to different futures. Some of those futures are possible, some of them are plausible, some of them are probable, and some of them are preferred. So what do we do with, with, with uh, systems artificial creativity? I'm not as convinced as others that one can clearly distinguish between philosophical questions and scientific questions or engineering questions. I think a key idea that I'm personally quite sure about is that we do need to open demographics as well as the disciplinary silos of who is engaged in artificial creativity. I recently read a book chapter written by six co-authors um, having opinions about the societal uh, acceptance of computational creativity and all of the authors were European and all were computer scientists, most of them men. To move artificial creativity into preferred futures, the research community needs to do better, needs to open up to other ways of understanding the world. Um, in one future timeline, one of the scenarios that can happen in the future is that we succeed in automating creativity, in optimizing it. What may be the consequences of that? What may be, the, what may be destroyed or what may be the trade-off in that process? I think a, a recent example of what is happening in sports can give us some idea on how to think about this. If we look at how analytics and big data have improved sports for performance, we can also appreciate how it has ruined the sports for spectators. Examples from the NBA and MLB um, come to mind, initially giving an advantage to those teams who adopt the strategies early, um, but ultimately diminishing the fun when the game um, changes as all the teams follow. 
So he, he, this for me is a very interesting question in the future because a lot of people are um, fearing that robots are going to take robots are going to take the jobs of humans. But I think the problem is that we are um, making humans more like robots. On the other hand, bear in mind that behind all the talk about big data and artificial intel intelligence, the nature of training data sets makes them unsuitable for creativity. This is what happened with uh, big data failing to help um, foresee terrorist attacks. Um, in the next few days, we're going to commemorate two years from the Christchurch attack, um, killing more than 50 people uh, by a white supremacist here in New Zealand. Um, so, so these systems, big data um, uh, analytics, they are good at identifying general patterns, uh, extrapolations from past occurrences, but they dismiss outliers treating the extraordinary as noise. And that is a problem for creativity um, when these type of systems are used. In another timeline, in a different timeline, we end up using artificial creativity to augment um, human creativity of the C type, C creativity. What are then the ethical implications of that scenario? Pablo Gervas from Madrid, um, he wrote a chapter in 2015 where he says, any new procedures or new types of artifact produced by computational creativity technologies are very likely to need human validation before being deemed acceptable. I completely agree with Pablo here. And that's why I came up with this creativity trolley problem. You know, this is a tongue in cheek of the of the trolley, the well known trolley problem. Um, and, and I use it to point to the possible ethical di dilemma of such human validation. What should the human do with the ideas produced by the computer? How shall humans choose and steer direct artificial creativity ideas? This silly thought experiment shows the importance of critical thinking to see where new ideas coming from artificial creativity could lead down the line. And it moves the conversation again from can a computer be creative to questions such as what do we do when computers are or make us creative? So in the creativity trolley problem, we have the trolley, which is the, um, the or the creative trolley, which is a source of artificial creativity. And we had it, we have two possible directions. In one of them, it's going to produce a lot of new ideas. And then we know that if we change directions in the trolley, it's going to, to generate maybe perhaps a, a lower number of ideas, fewer ideas, but perhaps of a different type. How do we anticipate? How do we know whether we should or shouldn't choose those or those ideas um, from, the, from the creative trolley in this case? What is the more ethical option? What is the right thing to do? So I'm gonna close um, the talk and thank you for, for watching until now with some general research questions for artificial creativity for the future. The, the first set of questions have to do with artificial creativity models as 4E, what is called 4E, embodied, embedded, and active and extended cognition. Um, the second has to do with creative interactions between levels in a system, what we're calling meso interactions between micro and macro levels. Um, artificial creativity for ideation, augmenting and training human ideation. Automation and optimization of creativity from what is possible, which is what has been leading um, for a few decades now, to start thinking about the consequences of doing this. And finally, I think the most important set of questions have to do with ethics. Who has access to these systems? Um, how, are, how are these systems used in fair ways? Where does authorship um, um, uh, lie? Where is, where is authorship in these systems? Who has the responsibility for ideas that come from a computational origin? And how, how do we explain um, where ideas come from in, in, in the case that something goes wrong. So that's it for me. Thank you for watching.